I've been a fan of a fan of Dan's work for a long time. So um, this is really fabulous. Thanks again, Anna. Um, so yeah, I I just I have this multi um, slide presentation that I actually give this. I have an advantage in it because I give this presentation about three days a week, um, in it's some various formats. Um, but I've condensed it here for 15 minutes, and then Dan will give his 15 minutes, and we can talk about, chat about maps. Um, so I, I'm at the Woodwell Climate Research Center, as Anna mentioned. Um, and uh, if you look at the building, I'm second uh, window from the right on the second floor. And I've been sitting in this chair for 17 years, but I've been in Woods Hole for 22 years. Uh, and in that time, I've probably worked with hundreds, maybe thousands of scientists, um, all on the level of geospatial and dealing with geospatial data. Um, and everywhere from managing the data sets to communicating the data sets. Um, and if you are all here, um, I would be super excited and I would invite you all to our map room. We have this cool map room um, that's uh, right here just outside my office on the second floor. And actually this map room has stood the test of time. Um, everything here on campus has changed as you can imagine over a couple of decades. Uh, but 22 years ago or 20 years ago when we moved this into this building, um, we had boxes everywhere and George Woodwell actually placed a map on one of these tables out here. He said, you know, this would be a good place for us to tell our story. This would be a good place to talk about Woodwell science. Um, and believe it or not, I actually had a photo from that. I found the photo of March 11, 2003, when all those boxes were stacked there and we pulled um, maps out and started talking about them. And that was the beginning of, you know, our, in quotes, map table. Um, to this day, it seems to be one of the greatest um, attractions on our campus tours. Uh, we have student groups come through, we have wealthy donors come mm -hmm. through, we have uh, high level policy people come through, we have collaborators and friends and um, uh, relatives come through and we talk about maps and the maps kind of like are in a stack and a jumble and we shuffle them around and make sure that um, those important ones for whatever group coming through is always on the top and we have great discussions. Um, our maps also leave here, of course, um, you know, you think about, you always want to make the map that you want to frame is one of my favorite quotes and each map is, a, is an important reflection of our work and you never know where those maps are going to end up. Um, in this case, uh, some of the maps went to um, uh, the COP meeting last fall um, in Dubai and Senator Murkowski <coughs> and Barkey here are, are looking at the maps and it turns out both of these folks are map fans. Um, and then they go on, on field trips as well. Um, I've, I've made a career out of not just making maps here and working with our scientists here, but actually going to some of many of these places and bringing maps with me and putting them on a table and discussing uh, what's happening live in the field and, and having just this fantastic collection of conversations. Um, you know, and you see a lot of paper maps here and you might say, you know, that's cool, but there's a lot of technology. What about the, you know, the interactive maps, the, the, the tablets and things like that? And the, we do that as well, but there's something about a paper map. You throw a paper map on a table and people start to talk, they start to point and so on. And even if there's errors, I've actually found that it's better if there's errors because you can't hold people back when they see a, an error on a map, they wanna jump right in and start pointing and talking about what's going on there. And I found that that's fabulous and it works very well with collaborative science work. Um, most recently, just this past Monday, some of our maps have made it to an art gal gallery here in town. There's an Arctic exhibit. Um, I see Aaron on here, Aaron Dysart and on the list of names here as well. And he has an exhibit there. And this is a Highfield Hall here in Falmouth. So if you, any of you are on the Cape, I encourage you to check out this art exhibit that's up until July 11th. Um, and it's a it's an old mansion that's been turned into a museum. And I can pretty confidently say that, you know, that image in the lower right where there's a retrogressive thaw slump um, above that fireplace is the first time that there's uh, been one of those hanging there. Um, so please do check it out if you're in town. Um, but so why maps? Well, why are we talking today? And I don't have to say this to this crowd. You probably all know this, but it's clear that maps themselves distill a story out of highly complex systems. And when it comes to climate change science, that's very important. Um, they can identify patterns and otherwise hidden data, uh, which is also very important. And as I mentioned, they invoke conversation. They pull people together and, and they inspire. Um, think about the last time you've been inspired by a map. Um, 
you know, I've been inspired by maps every day. I, I spent a lot of time looking at maps and, and gaining lots of inspiration. And I remember the first time I was inspired by a map, I was probably sitting in the backseat of my folks' car looking at, a, at an atlas map as we're cruising around. You know, a lot of people have that same story, but that really charged me up at an early time. Um, you know, and if you Google who is a cartographer, who makes these maps, this is, you know, the imagery you're going to get. Folks drafting on these big drafting tables and and be making beautiful artwork. And and that's still true. That's That still happens today. But the reality is that there's a lot of technology involved. There's a lot of data and information. And in my background, it is not really that art side, even though I got my first um, artist name tag last Monday uh, of my life. So... Um, it's been mostly what you see here, the, the data side of things for many, many years, decades now. Um, you know, if I think about my day-to-day -day work, um, it can be a collection of any of these things. And I think Dan or any other cartographer would have a similar list of what they have to pluck from each day to make these things. You know, I could be a GIS specialist at, at one point, but then I have to work with data and I have to manage the data. And, you know, you always have to step back and take that artistic approach. And, and you think about numbers like a statistician may. And of course, I'm writing code all day long. Um, you know, and thinking about, I have an Earth Engine archive with over 55,000 lines of Earth Engine code. Um, and I'm plucking from that on a regular basis to get material for my maps. And of course, you've, you've all kind of thought of maps maybe at, in this perspective at one point in time. You have art one side, science on the other. And in the middle, you have this kind of beautiful marriage of cartography. Um, but when you think about maps for a purpose, maps for science, maps for information, um, well, I've edited this to, to add kind of wonder through comprehension. Um, in the realm of science, you, you come up with wonder, you have a hypothesis, you think about something, and you want to get to the comprehension portion of that, and maps can kind of aid you on that path. And in the stages of science, it's just kind of coincidental that there's this sloping um, approach to like the number of map solutions that fit that scientific process that we all learned about in fifth grade. You know, at the beginning, when you have a hypothesis, you might put all the maps on the table. And it's like your, your lit review of all the maps you may know about, all the information you have. And as you do your process, you work your way through this, this slope here. And at the end, you've presented your map. You have your data that you can map and um, send out your conclusions. So as a cool example here, I, this is my son's map. He made this and he was like, I don't know, second grade or something like that. And I didn't help him make it. He made it at school and he made this by looking at, at other maps. And if you look down in the corner, there's this little section of um, dragons and stuff like that. And this would be the here be dragon portion of a map. Um, and that's how maps had were for many days. And I don't know if you know this, but the reason that was there is that there was often missing data and cartographers would um in some sort of artistic approach feel that with dragons or sea creatures and whatnot and of course this day and age it's it's just the exact opposite we have mounds of data mounds of information you think of all the data you can sift through in any given spatial product project and you have to get through that to get to the story and i've seen this in my career i remember early on in the late 90s early 2000s just not having enough data to complete many of the maps that we wanted to complete and now it's just the opposite. It's like, wow, what, what am I going to do with all this information? How can I just pull the story out of this? Um, this goes off. Uh, I can go off much longer here on this topic, but I'll just kind of summarize that for brevity here that the technologies around making maps are dynamic and changing, but cartography itself transcends centuries. And that's a quote by Mike Foster that I really like. So each map I make is um, has to follow these kind of cartographic design principles. If you want to know how to make a good map yourself, it's always going to include these. Um, we're going to share at the end, uh, it's the list of um, resources and citations. And this is one of the key ones I think you should visit. It's by Ingrid Buckley. Around 2011, she put these together. And I think of these and every map that I've made is kind of focused on this and has come from this triangle right here, where you have the cartographic design principles on the previous screen at the top circle. Uh, you have effective communication of those subject matter on the left circle. So does the map work? And then you have the preferences of who's asking for the map. So in my case, I work with scientists. That would be the lower right-hand um, circle. And they would come to me and 
they may have a favorite color palette. They may have a favorite approach to mapping. I have to kind of put that in this wheel and negotiate every time a map is made. And I've stepped back and look at all the maps I've made over time and they've always fit within the circle. But within science, you know, there's this contrast that, you know, no map is the perfect truth. Um, there's a, another famous quote that a map is, all maps are an agreed, agreed upon set of lies. Um, and that contrasts with science because science wants to put accurate information up there all the time and, and it, it strives to get the answer. And a map is an abstraction of reality. So we're always kind of contrasting that. And I would really like, if you get a chance to follow Andy uh, Woodruff on social media, he put this post up years ago and he talks about the, the facts that no maps are perfect truth. Um, you know, some maps can do some things good, some maps can do some things bad. Of course, there's bias within maps. And you have to think about all these things when you're making maps. So um, I'm just going to kind of close this section with saying, what's my goal in making maps? My goal is, fit, is fitted by Tom Patterson's quote really well. Uh, Tom Patterson was the chief cartographer for the National Park, Park Service for many years. And I heard him say this many years ago at a presentation, and I just realized uh, recently that it's on his website as well. And um, he and I interacted, and he, he gave me the permission to, to use this quote in my presentation. So I use it widely. It, it's great. He says, the goal is to make a map that will attract and hold the attention of readers for as long as possible and explore visual exploration. If you think about this day and age, you know, we're all... Uh, on social media or our, our devices and things like that. And you're trying to get attention, especially a nonprofit like Woodwell. You're trying to get your story out there. And a good map is that hook. You can kind of hook people. And if you get an extra second with that hook, maybe you can tell more of your story and then you're being successful. Um, myself and Christina, the other cartographer here, we work a lot with our communications group and we make sure that maps, beautiful maps are always at the forefront uh, just for that reason. So I'm going to talk about color for a few minutes, and then Dan's going to dive in deeper in, in his presentation. And the reason I want to talk about color is that I actually have a whole series of challenges that scientists have when it comes to making maps. Um, and I, I don't have time to do that here. There's, there's uh, many, many um, of them. But I have to talk about color because for some reason, color is so powerful. Um, colors, uh, uh, you know, connect to your emotions. And... Um, I, I would start by saying that, you know, when it comes to thinking about color and you put them on a map, the best thing is to just to know that you're not, you shouldn't do it alone. You should do it with others. There's these days and age, uh, this day and age, there's so many resources uh, for help with colors. Um, I have a couple of people on here like Joshua and Heather and Christina and others I worked with. And there's a couple of resources on here, um, like Color Brewer and, 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 Color Cafe and, and others that you can connect with. And we'll, again, we'll uh, provide links at the end. But the background here is that you shouldn't ever think that you're going it alone with colors. There are many people who are really good at dealing with colors. Um, colors have kind of, um, you can picture them as like the pheromones, the important parts of your map. And you should always seek help and, and talk with folks when it comes to colors and your figures and charts and others and maps. This is my world. <laughs> uh, this is one of my favorite memes on the internet. I, I, I live here. I see it all the time. And I would probably just cross this off and say pretty much all science maps are like this. Um, for decades, scientists come to me and it's like, I want to put everything on there. I want this color. I want it to bold. I want it to pop. I want it to grab people. And, and that this is just really, really frustrating. And where you see that the most is places like weather maps and, and, and climate and maps you know you have a simple comparison like this where you're showing the same data in both of these maps but one is just clear and concise and to the point and the other one uh, is not um, and the takeaway here is that yeah if you seek help and, and you can narrow it down you can make things very very efficient you're going to get your audience much faster and if you say to me like I i'm not good at colors well where do i start i've asked for help but i i don't know which ones to choose you know one of my techniques is just to look around at color panels that exist you know nature has been doing this for a really long time this is a lunar moth a lunar moth that i saw by the bike rack one day and i found wow that's a perfect divergent color palette and i went into color brewer and i found it, it's the same color palette that's in color brewer that um, folks have been using for years um, likewise, bioluminescence, uh, I've been using that in maps for many years. 
And this is now the Verdes color palette, which is very commonly used in science and probably overused as, as, um, as far as I'm concerned, but it's really effective. Um, and you look around like the, on the lower left-hand side, um, I saw this robot on a TV show one day and I thought that that would be fantastic color ramp. Um, and the next day I was making a map of offset of annual carbon uptake by ecosystem respiration and it seemed to fit so well. So it just went together and made a, a really good um, result. And I spent a lot of time looking out of windows, flying to the Arctic. Um, you know, last year I, I flew to Alaska five times from Massachusetts, which is a significant flight, uh, way too much time on a plane. But if you get the window seat, um, I recommend taking a peek outside and seeing what you see. Um, it's pretty spectacular. The image there is not far from where Anna lives. Um, and inspired by that, I came back on one of those trips last year and I started working on this map where I took some natural imagery, uh, satellite imagery, and I melded it with um, uh, elevation data to work on a base map for our biggest project, our biggest Arctic project here, the Permafrost Pathways. And it turned out pretty well. I, I did it for all of Alaska. I worked hard at getting cloud-free imagery and, and, and a nice DEM for the entire state. Um, and the idea here is that I was just looking at something I see in my environment and I applied that to a map and it worked really well uh, as a map product. And we're now using this as a base map for a lot of the uh, products that come out of that project. And you can fade it off a bit and put text over it if you wanted, but it, it's a really simple approach. And if you're curious, there's an entire story map about how this is made. And I created this by uh, working um, following a lot of the techniques of other cartographers um, out there. So if you haven't been listening until now, um, I just walk away with these five points. Here's some information for you that I, that I uh, uh, am providing. Uh, one is that if you improve your cartography, it's gonna improve our science. Um, I have no data to back this up, but I think uh, our grant proposals are more successful when they have good maps in them. I think our communications are, are good, more successful when they have good maps in them. And of course, all of the science can uh, benefit from good maps. Um, Real-time information, of course, is key. Uh, all the technology is good, but you know, print maps are not dead. Uh, I can't, like our, our plotter runs almost continuously out here with, with new map products and people want those maps. Um, principles of map making need to be followed, of course. Um, let's see. And don't be afraid to ask for assistance. There's lots of, um, uh, skills out there and the cartographic community is really generous and really nice and they're super eager to, to help anyone when it comes to map related issues. Uh, lastly, maps are essential for storytelling, which you folks probably know, but I just like to reiterate it. Um, if you want to read more about maps at Woodwell, uh, Sarah Ruiz did a great story about myself and Christina here um, and you can, uh, we'll provide this link at the end. Um, but we have time for Dan. Um, I'm going to end there and just shout out that this is where I am. If you want to follow with, along with me or, or to chat with me, or whatnot. Um, but I'm going to pause there, stop sharing, and hopefully leave plenty of time for Dan and others. Is that, um, there you go. Yep. All right. Well, thank you, Greg, for sharing your, uh, for distilling your many years of experience into those awesome ideas and thoughts about maps. That was fantastic. Um, so I just dropped a link to these slides, to my slides in the chat for anyone who's interested. There's a PDF of them in there for looking at them later on. But um, I am, I'm the graphics editor for the Washington Geological Survey here in Washington State. And much of my work here supports our various science teams. Um, I've had a hand in most things visual that we publish here at the survey, including illustrations, photography, and video. Um, but my main role is as lead map maker for our group. So today I'm gonna focus on many of the cartographic concepts that Greg just discussed kind of through the lens of geology, natural hazard, and terrain mapping that I've done over the years. So here is an aerial photo of Mount Rainier in Washington. Um, imagery, you know, as Greg has shown, can give us a wealth of information about a place, but it can often be kind of visually noisy, and sometimes it can make it difficult to focus on singular aspects of the landscape. 
Um, in this case, I wanted to focus on Mount Rainier's glaciers. So let's switch over from imagery to a colorized hillshade. So by using color and contrast here, this terrain image focuses the viewer's attention on those icy blue glaciers, while the darker surrounding terrain is kind of visually pushed back, creating a solid figure ground relationship, which is one of those visual design principles that Greg mentioned earlier. Um, this approach can also work well in perspective view as shown here in this image of Washington's Mount Baker with a very similar color palette. Um, this is a really interesting spot. This is in the Columbia River Gorge. Um, this is a, kind of an aerial view of the site of the Bonneville landslide. And the Bonneville landslide was this enormous geologic event that happened about 600 years ago when the entire side of a mountain collapsed. And it actually created a natural dam on the Columbia River for a, for a time period. Um, eventually that dam was breached and part of the landslide deposit was washed away, but most of it still kind of sticks out into the Columbia River today. So um, at the survey, we wanted to create a map to, to kind of visualize that landform and also to tell its story. So to start off, we traded the imagery for a LIDAR derived hill shade so you can really see the shape of the land without the kind of distraction of the trees and textures. And then we use color to show the Bonneville landslide itself, as well as the Columbia River. And then added some additional colors, labels, and text to give the, the map features a visual hierarchy and balance. So the things that are more important come to the forefront of your sort of visual field, and the things that are less important kind of go to the background. And one other thing I wanted to point out about this map that I think is really important, um, we also added a small graphical representation of the modern day Bridge of the Gods, which is a bridge across the Columbia that people are very familiar with, um, just in order to connect kind of this huge abstract geologic scale, this mega feature to a more recognizable, smaller human scale that people can understand. Um, this is a ele uh, relative elevation model of the Skagit River in northern Washington, and this shows areas where the elevation of the floodplain is close to the river surface, so places where it may be more likely to flood when there's a lot of water. Um, and this is an interesting image, but it could really use some geographic context, so how can we do that? To achieve that, you can add in imagery and some nice high contrast labels um, and blend that with that image. The only issue with this now is that kind of that bright green color of that imagery is kind of visually competing with the the kind of the important data of that river, um, that kind of pinkish river color. So one really simple fix for that is to just convert the imagery to grayscale to kind of push it to the background and put that focus back on the river. Um, this allows you to retain that valuable geographic context and it also kind of gives you that, that visual hierarchy again. Um, and this grayscale base map approach, it works really well, not only for kind of static maps like this, but also many web maps, data portals, and dashboards. I like base maps to kind of be in the background and available to see when you want to, to, to get information from them, but not to distract from your overall message. Okay, but what if the colors and textures of aerial imagery are really essential to your map's message? That is definitely the case in this map of Mount St. Helens, um, which features five ways the landscape of the volcano itself has changed since its 1980 eruption. Um, if you look in that lower corner, there's a little mini map key. So by creating this little mini map key, we'll enlarge that, you can help to guide the viewer to the main points of the map without feeling the need to simplify, tone down, or reduce your imagery that's helping to tell your story. Um, that said, there are instances where it's necessary and um, a good idea to emphasize smaller details to tell your map story. One of the main features in this particular map is the crater glacier inside Mount St. Helens crater, um, which has actually been growing for the past several decades. But in the original imagery shown here and in real life, you know, it, it's very difficult to see that glacier due to all the ash and rockfall that's kind of falling down from the crater walls on top of it. So in order to highlight that, we just added a, a little bit of a bluish white um, color fill to that glacier and kind of delineated it with some shadowing. So we'll go before and after. So that really allows the viewer to actually see where that glacier is. Otherwise, it's somewhat invisible. 
Um, so this is a USGS volcano hazard map for Mount Rainier. And so if Mount Rainier were to erupt, it could cause some major problems. Um, many communities in this region could be affected by volcanic debris flows known as lahars. And while this map shows the geographic range of potential lahars really well, it does not relate well to kind of human scale or perspective. So we're going to focus on one community um, northwest of here called Ording and switch our perspective. So by changing this into perspective view and kind of looking over the community back to the mountain, those Lahar zones become more understandable. You can see the spatial relationship between that community and the volcano. Um, by using imagery and a digital surface model, you can actually see those little housing developments in the Ording Valley um, within that hazard zone, making this data more relatable to a human level sort of perspective. And just on a quick side note, much of Ording is actually built on top of a 30 foot thick Lahar deposit from an eruption about 500 years ago. So this is a very real um, potential hazard if Mount Rainier were to erupt. Um, similarly, in this map of Lake Chelan, we wanted to make the depth of Washington's deepest lake more relatable. So let's zoom in here a little bit. Um, so we used a, a really familiar Washington icon, the Space Needle. Um, kind of as a measuring stick on the far right of that image. And you can see that Lake Chelan's depth is about two and a half space needles deep. So it gives you a, a, a more relatable um, measuring device. So what do you do if you have too much information on the map? Um, this is often a problem. And in this case, you can see this kind of noodly mess here. We needed to show all of the LIDAR data sets that were used in a particular project in a map. So many of them kind of overlapped and it made it difficult to, to deal with. So the simple solution, put each data set on its own little map. And that way you can kind of easily compare them side by side and see um, where the information was coming from, from those individual data sets. This approach can also work well for comparing time series data, such as these images from channel change on the Nooksack River over an 18 year period. And in this particular case, we realized that you could even simplify these further to make those channels more um, visually comparable. So you can see they're a little easier to compare now. Um, one other way you can do this, of course, you can create an, anima an animation um, and that kind of adds a dimension of movements to more easily see those changes over time if you put them sequentially. So you can see how this river has migrated downstream over time. Time series maps are also really effective storytelling devices. Um, so instead of just showing a single map of the Ice Age Missoula floods, as you can see here, we decided to create several different map frames to kind of animate this story and add richness to it. So. We animated this ice dam breach, this glacial lake bursting through the glacier, and then the gradual draining of Glacial Lake Missoula as the floodwaters kind of flowed across the Pacific Northwest landscape toward the Pacific Ocean. Um, animating time series data can also add additional nuances that static maps don't provide. Um, these are tsunami inundation and current speed maps for a really large modeled Cascadia earthquake on the Washington coast. <clears throat> now, while they do provide detailed information on modeled water depths and detailed information on current speed, they don't really show the, the complicated hydrodynamics of how a tsunami actually works. So we decided to make um, some animations of that time series data of that modeled tsunami. And this sim tsunami simulation video provides kind of a much more dynamic view of so how tsunami events unfold, illustrating that they occur over a long period of time and are not just a single wave. And just to let you know, this is sped up about 360 times faster than it would happen in reality. So you see that initial wave coming in, but that's not the only one, they keep coming. And if you look, hopefully you can see in the lower right corner, there's kind of a time ticker right now it's at about two hours and as it goes on you can see more and more tsunami waves inundating the coastline so those static maps don't really give you this sort of um, idea of how a tsunami might work so 
So I, I just wanted to tell Greg, I really love his slides about getting color palettes from the natural environment. Um, I think about this all the time when I'm walking around. It's springtime in the Pacific Northwest, and there are like a million different kinds of green outside right now. And I, I just want to like capture them all and collect them all into a color palette. Um, but this is one good example. I was at work one day working on um, colors for a tsunami evacuation map. And I looked over at my screensaver, a photo I took of a madrone tree, which is my favorite kind of tree. And I was like, wait, there might be some sort of uh, sub subconscious influence here on my color palette that I'm working on on my map. And it fortunately, it worked really well. Um, and also, fortunately, I was lucky that that madrone color palette was also colorblind friendly. Um, as you can see here in this side by side um, colorblind simulation. So. I think it's about 4.5% of people on earth have some sort of color vision deficiency. So this is a really important consideration when you think about, you know, one out of 20 people has some sort of color blindness, um, especially if you're making maps for things like public safety or public, you know, any sort of public um, relations sort of thing. Um, this simulation here was done in Adobe Illustrator where there's, you know, a few different ways you can view your graphics and a couple different colorblind simulation modes. So it's really useful um, for testing out colors. There's also a lot of great online resources for testing out colors for like for colorblindness. Um, there's one called Color Oracle that I highly recommend that is also in that um, list of links that Greg mentioned here that will be at the end. And that's also a really good reminder that we should, you know, you should always keep your map audience in mind. Um, we often attend public meetings with many of our draft maps in order to have conversations and get feedback from community members, public officials, and other interested parties. Um, and these are often really good opportunities to find that, that perfect balance between scientific communication researcher preferences and cartographic design that Greg mentioned earlier. And like also like Greg mentioned, People are not afraid to point out mistakes or things that, um, you know, could be more accurate in a map, which is a great, great way to just kind of lubricate that conversation. And also, as Greg pointed out, it's really great to go to the place you're mapping. Um, it can be incredibly important to visit those places and to work with communities to understand their local geography and needs. Um, these photos were from a trip last year that I took with our tsunami team to uh, the coastal village of Tahola, which is in the Quinault Indian Nation, where we were developing a tsunami evacuation map. Um, there were several, several critical updates to the map that were made, and you can see one of them being made there, <laughs> an impromptu map edit um, in the fields. Uh, there are several critical updates we made that were made as a result of local knowledge gathered during that visit. And um, Tahola, interestingly enough, is actually moving a lot of their village up the hill to get out of the way of, um, you know, climate change induced sea level change and um, potential tsunami hazards. So a few closing thoughts, a lot of these kind of echo the ones Greg already mentioned. Um, you know, maps Maps are really valuable tools that help us kind of simplify and make sense of the world. Um, by using some of those design principles, we can make maps that clearly tell our stories. And, you know, if a map isn't having the desired effect, try a new angle, try a new perspective, and also try to connect your data to the human experience. Keep the relevant science and communities at the forefront of your maps, because that's who we're making the maps for and never be afraid to ask for help with a map design. Um, as Greg mentioned, you know, there's a great cartographic community out there and, you know, we're always willing to, to give our, our time and um, kind of experience to help others make better maps. So definitely reach out. And really quick, I just wanted to leave you with a few images of the Liana River Delta and the Yukon River. In my spare time, I make a lot of river images using open data from around the world, and these are a few of my favorites. So this is the, the full Atlanta River Delta. Here's kind of a detailed view. The, those last two images were made using um, open Arctic DEM data from the Polar Geospatial Center. And here's a LIDAR-derived image of the Yukon River in Yukon Flats National Wildlife Refuge in Alaska. A little further downstream, this is actually um, an IFSAR-derived elevation image of the Yukon, also in Yukon Flats. 
And then last but not least on the Yukon Delta, this one's pretty wild, but um, uh, these are thermocar thermokarst lakes on the Yukon River Delta. So those different colors kind of indicate subtle elevation differences between those areas. That's all I have. Um, thank you for listening. And here's my contact info. I'll just leave this up for a few seconds. Um, we also, like Greg said, he put kindly put together um, this next slide of links that is packed full of super great information if you're interested in um, making better maps. Wow. Right. Thank you, Dan and Greg. This is incredible. I've you two are truly celebrating the landscape we have around us. And and uh, I'm definitely going to walk outside <laughs> and think about color palettes <laughs> now on. <laughs> so I'm curious to hear, Greg and, and, and Dan, you know, what kind of thoughts came up in your when you were listening to each other? And like any reflections you might have? Uh, I, I could start, I guess, um, because I have a ton of reflections. Uh, thank you, Dan, for that. That was fantastic. Um, I would first point out that Dad also has tutorials on his his website. Um, so if you want to learn how to make some of these maps, I encourage everybody to check those out. Um, but I, I saw some questions in the in the chat about um, software, uh, Anna, and I just want to maybe make some comments on that. Um, there's if you think about a, a finished map product, you have to have software that deals with the data. You have to have software that organizes the data, and then you have to have software that makes the data beautiful. Um, and my approach here at Woodwell is, is always to use whatever is the best software for that particular task at that time. And so I, I like, I enjoy learning new software. Um, I, I think actually I spend most of my time in Adobe software um, for the beautiful portion. Uh, of course, I use ArcGIS Pro or QGIS in the, in the, in the past for organizing the data. Um, and then I write a ton of Python and Earth Engine code and JavaScript and things like that. Um, so to, to, to dig in and, and do analytics to get the, re, the data to map. Um, so it's really hard to answer those questions, but uh, just uh, as Dan, Dan mentioned, there's plenty of folks out there willing to help um, and that includes software. Um, and then my last response here, Anna, it was that, um, you know, there's an old uh, saying about, if you want to take good photos, stand in front of good things. Um, the same is true for maps. Um, if, if you want to make cool maps, you know, use cool data. <laughs> and as uh, Dan was presenting some of his stuff, I was just thinking of how awesome it is to have access to like that LIDAR data, which, you know, is a modern thing. Um, and it, a lot of folks compliment my map, but my maps are just reflection of the science that's happening here at Woodwell. You know, Anna Science and, and all the other PIs are leading these projects and they're producing really cool work. And so a cool map is just reflecting how, how cool that stuff is. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll stop talking there. I want to pick it up, Dan. Yeah, I would echo Greg's comments on that. You know, we we're, we kind of act as translators of all of this wealth of data and information and knowledge from all these other people and data, you know, organizations. So, you know, we make interesting maps, but it's not just us making these. It's like a huge community of people that kind of funnel into this this sort of graphical representation of things. So um, yeah, it's good to give gratitude to everybody else out there as well. Um, but I would also agree like using GIS and graphics both. I, I definitely, like Greg said, you use whatever tool is best for the particular job at hand, and, um, which there are many out there, especially now. So agree with that. All right, I'm going to stop the recording here and then see what questions people might have. Thank you.